so what I'm going to start with today, it's actually, uh, I realized as I breezed through the slides, um, since I was focusing more on Johannes' defense, uh, there's actually a lot that I am striving to get through in 25 minutes. So, so if you lose your hat as, as we're breezing through something, I hope that you'll come back and stop me so that we can revisit it if, ne if needed. But the question that we're, I'm going to be addressing is whether cultural ecosystem services might be the keys to sustainability. So we're going to go like this. So first, with ecosystem services, I think you could argue that ecosystem services are the great green hope, that as sustainability actually took a bit of a retrenchment from the logic of limits and hard and fast planetary boundaries, actually, it took ecosystem services to bring the, eco the, the ecological dimensions of the economy back into the conversation. Um, and I think Eric... Uh, has done some analysis, actually, to suggest that that is the case. If you look at ecosystem services, its rise has been astronomical. Um, after, you know, starting with uh, some early publications in the 1990s, there was a trickling of effort until 2005, when all of a sudden it shot up at exponential, exponential growth since then. And in terms of the adoption in public agencies, in NGOs, in multilateral organizations, etc. You'll find ecosystem services throughout the conservation world. But how does it relate to sustainability? So I'm going to be taking a Brundtland-like definition of sustainability that is effectively just not undermining others' capacity for a good life. Right? And you'll see that what I've done is take what was an intergenerational concept at the global scale and I've broadened it to be, to apply to the current generation and to any spatial scale. It's an ideal, obviously. It's impossible to not undermine anybody's capacity for a good life, but we can strive for it. It can be applied at any scale, and I, I would argue should be. It's actually quite uncontroversial because it stems right from the golden rule, which is the foundation of almost every ethical system on this planet, and it's pressing. What ecosystem services as a concept offers is to extend that golden rule in time and space through ecological dimensions, right? Insofar as we undermine the planet's capacity to provide for others through ecosystem services, we are undermining sustainability. And I'm not going to go through these, uh, these arrows, but just to point out that this is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, suggesting that collectively we are undermining the world's ecosystem services. So does the concept and the work that's done in the field of ecosystem services actually contribute to sustainability? Well, this could be a whole talk in and of itself, but I'm going to argue no. And no primarily because it doesn't change the conversation about the fundamental drivers that undermine ecosystem services. Um, this is uh, a cover article, or a cover from The Economist from just about 10 years ago, after the publication of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and also some very interesting private deals surrounding ecosystem services. The Economist, a publication not known for taking a pro-environment stance, declared that maybe environmental, environmentalism wasn't dead, as it had declared a few months ago. <laughs> because if you could profit from doing good environmentally, then maybe there was some hope after all. So because ecosystem services hasn't been challenging these major forces that do undermine ecosystem services and other dimensions of sustainability, I'm going to argue it doesn't yet address them. But now let's get to those categories that Thomas already talked about. So the four categories, provisioning, regulating, supporting, cultural, I'm not going to go through the details, but just to say, as Thomas did, that cultural was put alongside the others as if separate. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Not just separate, but the poor cousin of the others, right? Because if you look at this figure, one of the, probably the most widely cited figure from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, you can see by the width of the arrows and by the light color of those coming from the cultural box at the bottom, that cultural ecosystem services were seen to have very weak or at most medium intensity of linkages between ecosystem services and human well-being, and also, surprisingly, to have low potential for mediation by socioeconomic factors. 
I wasn't part of the MA, so I can just blame them at will, right? Um, no, there was lots of great work done there, but, but this thinking around culture was perhaps problematic. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing from the same chorus that, uh, that Thomas did in saying that, that in many ways, cultural ecosystem services are everywhere, but they're also nowhere, right? So the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment defined cultural services as the non-material benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. And yet, as in this paper by Terry Daniel et al, where we're both in the et al, um, the, the research that has really been done within ecosystem services has mostly been relegated to visual aesthetics associated with landscapes and then recreation and tourism. And the rest, although there are really important studies that have been done elsewhere, they haven't been integrated into ecosystem services research in any systematic or sophisticated way. Um, so that led us in a, in a paper in 2012 to claim that ecosystem services are both everywhere and also nowhere. The everywhere is simple, right? That culture is everything. Culture is to humans as water is to fish, to paraphrase Kitayama. And then to, to quote a friend of mine, Neil Hannes, who is the private land, or the land assets manager for Kamehameha Schools, which is the largest private landowner in Hawaii, um, basically the, the First Nations stewardship organization there. He says that the, you know, after years of trying to figure out how we could best carve up and develop our natural assets, we finally realized that we were going about it all wrong and that those monetary values that we could capture through that kind of development were not getting us to a better place for our people. It's the, the intangibles where we really get at well-being, he said. So in a very complicated set of chapters and papers, we argued just why culture is the big bubble within which ecosystems, ecosystem services, all the rest of them, ought to be understood. And the logic goes something like this. If you think about the categories of benefits that we might derive from ecosystem, there's a long possible list. This is not an exhaustive one. But we, we've got, thinking about it, say from the perspective of fish, we have the material benefits of the fish in terms of the physical sustenance. We have the aesthetics of the experience of going fishing, the place and heritage values that we derive through going there with people and catching fish, S activity benefits of, of that actual physical activity, um, which is helpful in lots of ways, spiritual benefits associated with the experience of being there um, and being there with people, inspiration of various kinds. I could go on, but I'm not going to. Point is, though, that although the modeling efforts that I've been involved in associated with the Natural Capital Project largely tried to draw one-to-one -one relationships between ecosystem services and benefits, it isn't that simple, right? Because a single activity like subsistence fishing actually leads to all of these benefits simultaneously in an interconnected, inseparable kind of way. And what that means then is that there is really no ecosystem service that doesn't have cultural dimensions of a kind, right? Okay, so that, that's, uh, that's one or two parts of, of what I wanted to say about these chap of this chapter and papers. But the other bit is that you can understand the value dimensions as, also, as being equally sophisticated where any given benefit might be valued in terms of people might place some importance on, on it for a wide variety of reasons. And that you can understand those reasons as falling out on at least eight different dimensions. And so each of the rows on the right is a dimension of our of value, where a given reason for caring, you can be situated on all eight of those dimensions simultaneously, right? And so for the market-mediated ones, where, market, where monetary valuation is appropriate, we argued, um, in the, the two papers that these are actually just one of two to the eighth possible quadrants in this eight-dimensional space, right? Where it basically has to be preference-oriented, market-mediated benefits, mostly about oneself at individual levels, the physical rather than the metaphysical, the final values rather than the supporting, non-transformative, and anthropocentric. 
And you can fall out in anywhere else on that space and it makes market valuation either incomplete or inappropriate. So there's a lot more to that point, but I, I'm going to just breeze on and we can come back to it if you like. So we, um, we field tested some of these ideas on the north coast of Vancouver Island, a beautiful place that uh, I'd highly recommend visiting. Um, and I'd be happy to host you if you do come out that way. And we, um, we interviewed a range of people about their, their perception of benefits associated with the marine environment. And I just want to read you one example of, uh, of a quote. So Sarah Klein interviewed a, a fisherman um, and he said, and, and he was talking about the, the benefits associated with just, just one kind of service. We had prompts associated with various kinds of services or benefits. And, and I don't even remember exactly which one it was. But he said, especially now that I have children, when you cook food that you've caught with your own hands and set it down in front of your own offspring, and it's good food, like a salmon, that's so good for you. It's a spiritual act. That's like such a connection to place, to earth, doing something so tangible, eating and getting nutrients, you're out there just trawling this single line, and to be able to catch it, to do battle with it, sometimes you win, sometimes it wins, it's more like a dance than a battle. So we coded these kinds of answers for a variety of benefits, right? So other-oriented values, um, food as being provisioning, subsistence material, the catching as being the recreation or activity, spiritual, obvious, sense of place, and the artistic associated with that dance metaphor. Which just goes to show that you know, these, these bundles that have mostly been talked about in terms of bundles of things provided by a patch of land ought to be interpreted at the scale of individuals. And actually, we'll come back to that this afternoon. Um, as being things that we experience these multiple benefits simultaneously associated with, in some cases, a single action or activity. So put another way, more recently, um, coined this term uh, proper and helps. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. The culturality of ecosystem services. I'm putting an idea, or putting an, a great term and an idea that I've been pushing for a while. That cultural values are the layers of meaning through which all ecosystem services and well-being are interpreted and valued. Now, if you take that and then you, you superimpose on that idea, which I've argued for, the culturality idea, the definition of cultural ecosystem services, which here, ecosystems contributions to human well-being, including experiences and capabilities via human natural interactions. If you can remove yourself from having been embedded in this, this way of thinking enough, you can see how convoluted it is, right? Because it's partitioning the ecosystem contribution only in something that we went bent over backwards to recognize was actually the product of human natural interactions, right? And not the solo work of ecosystems. And then focusing only on the human well-being components of a very intricate relationship. Okay, so it's convoluted and what are the implications of that? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pause that idea there for a moment and dig in a little bit more to, to cultural ecosystem services and how we can understand that in this context of sustainability. And I'm gonna take you now to the outer coast of Vancouver Island, um, where fishing is a bit different. Um, there's fishing for salmon, but there's also fishing for other things. I, I have, uh, for years now, had a, a large project associated with sea otters in kelp forests, um, where sea otters return has brought back large expanses of kelp forests to the detriment, unfortunately, of, uh, well, the sea otters are to the detriment of shellfish fisheries. Um, but in the, in, the, in the context of the kelp forests, some, some of the fin fish are coming back. Our, my colleagues and I strive to figure out which were the important ecosystem services in, in these areas. And we tried to do that just by looking at the fisheries reports for the ones that are of, of high commercial values. So imagining that if we did that and then we talked to the officials, you know, the experts, the chiefs, that we'd get a good sense of what was most important. And we found out that salmon and halibut were really important and we got the sense that rockfish, like this one here, black rockfish, were relatively unimportant. Very small 
commercial values and recreational values associated with. They're second, the kind of second best prize or third best prize if you can't catch a halibut or a salmon. But we learned through interviews that actually the, these fish, which are called black bass colloquially on the coast, are actually considered to be keystone species effectively. Because a fisherman, a local fisherman there, told us that it's after a, a very prominent salmon run was decimated, apparently due to sea lice associated with farm salmon, but that's another story, the black bass are the only fish that are abundant enough with enough fight that are tasty enough once you've caught the fish to actually ensnare, to put a kind of fisheries term, little boys on the act of fishing, which is absolutely critical to their whole cultural heritage. And so in this way, that experience of fishing for black bass is the kind of gateway to the whole experience of living in these coastal communities where fishing is a way of life. And without this, these, these species, which are very long lived and so in danger due to overharvest, it arguably their whole w way of understanding the world would shift. And Sarah, Sarah Klein, in those earlier interviews, documented multiple ways that whole experiences and worldviews actually stemmed from these activities on the water. So that view is one where, in some cases, cultural ecosystem services provide this turning, this roundabout of experiences, like of fishing, yielding the interest in fishing, yielding the capabilities associated with fishing, but not only fishing, also understanding the water, knowing how to navigate in storms, how to use a boat through kelp forests and rocky passages and all the rest of it, that enables more experiences, that captivate people for life and yield tremendous well-being. And if you take that view, and you superimpose on that the lens of capital, right? And, and you imagine the five forms of capital that have been recognized, human, social, natural, built, financial. Then, you know, it was long thought, I think, in, in at least some circles, that ecosystem services were related, were related to capital as the interest off the capital. And that sustainability was when you had a continuous flow of that interest. But in this case, with cultural ecosystem services, I think you could argue that the capabilities that result from, key, from cultural ecosystem services are actually a form of human capital. And specifically, perhaps, a form of human natural capital, right? That human, na that human capital that unlocks these close relationships with natural capital. And moreover, that the experiences might be the seed capital, right? To keep using this metaphor, which is unfortunate in some respects of capital, where it's, it's having those experiences that enable the whole roundabout, right, uh, that we talked about earlier with the black bass. And that all produces not only well-being, but also identity and norms. And so arguably, what we're talking about here, what's most important with respect to culture and ecosystem services isn't a category to go alongside the others, but actually relationships and values about relationships between people and nature. So now these are all coming from a paper that's in press in PNAS, and I'm just gonna give you some examples of, uh, of what I mean by relationships and values about relationships, or what we're calling relational values. Um, so this is a quote from Toni Morrison's Nobel lecture where she says, I don't know whether the bird, uh, sorry, um, this is, uh, she tells a story where young people were approached by an old woman, um, who, sorry, young people approached an old woman who was supposed to be clairvoyant but blind, and they, testing her and provoking her, ask her repeatedly whether the bird in their hands is living or dead, until she finally answers this, I don't know whether the bird you are holding is dead or alive, but what I do know is that it is in your hands. It is in your hands. And what she means is that regardless of a thing or a being's current state, what matters most, she's arguing, are our responsibilities, which stem from our relationships to those things. The second example from Berta Martin Lopez is uh, of transhuman shepherds and sheepdogs on their annual migration from the north to the south of the Iberian Peninsula. 
And the care of the shepherds for their animals is a relationship that's rooted in tradition that goes well beyond the management for human benefit. So Antonio Mercado's poem, By Walking One Makes the Way, and this, this line is especially famous or popular among these transhuman shepherds as inspiration to maintain their relationships, both with the animals, with people, and with nature more broadly, and the cultural identity that they stem from that through this ritual care. And a third example is of relationships with trees. Um, this is actually a picture of an ancient olive tree on the island of Aegina, Greece, from Karina Benesaya, which is estimated to be 1,500 to 2,000 years old. And the tree, as part of an uh, ancient standing olive grove, is no longer harvested, but has great symbolic significance for island people and visitors. And many trees can be living monuments in this kind of way. And we used a quote from Henry David Thoreau to illustrate that. I frequently tramped eight or 10 miles through deepest snow to keep an appointment with a beech tree or a yellow birch or an old acquaintance among the pines. A fourth example was the salmon that I already read to you. So I won't, uh, I won't tell you that one also, but just to point out that this is very much another example of these relational values. So what are relational values? Well, they're identity, norms, and notions of a good life. They're principles and virtues about relationships. They're key to sustainability. Both by uh, cultivating stewardship identities and norms and practices, um, and, and arguably, they ought to cause us to re redefine what we mean by well-being. And that's a... That's a comp more complicated point than I have time to explain right now. Um, but this one relates that sustainability ought to be seen as not just maintaining the capital, but maintaining the right relationships that allow a, a, that kind of a continuation in perpetuity. So you might be thinking, isn't conservation all about intrinsic or instrumental values? That's what we've been told, right, by this debate that's been going on for decades. Um, and the Snoopy comic illustrates it well. Snoopy's walking down, uh, down the way and he's saying, an observant scout can learn a lot on a hike. We can learn about the web of nature, sunlight, air, plants, water, soil, birds, microorganisms, all working together to make a better life for beagles, right? Because we've got this incredibly complex world and the ecosystem services literature has distilled from that the one tiny bit of it that we think is most relevant to us. And what we're uh, suggesting instead is to ask first if a program is consistent with and fosters the right relationships and relational values rather than asking whether it yields human well-being in a direct and instrumental kind of way. And then think of the outcomes for nature and human well-being. Um, I've pretty much used up my time, but uh, another fi figure just to illustrate this um, is to show instrumental value and intrinsic value, where intrinsic value is situated in the things of nature, um, where nature has value independent of people. Instrumental value is that kind of one-way flow of value from nature to people. And then relational values are all kinds of different possibilities that involve relationships both with other people and also directly with nature. They can be either at the individual level or at the collective level. And I'm not gonna go into all of them because I've used up my time. Um, but I can send this paper when it'll come out in a, in a few weeks. So to wrap up, ecosystem services are central to sustainability by connecting environmentalism and social justice to people and people to nature, right? By extending the golden rule or putting a human face on environmental change. Cultural ecosystem services, long thought to be minor considerations, are actually all about relationships, where the, those experiences and capabilities can be seen as seed or human natural capital. And so really it's all about relationships and relational values. And I'd say, ask not what relationships can do for you, ask what relationships can do for sustainability. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.